And as a, as a nation, we were moving westward. Looking at this map, you see some big cities, Baltimore, Philadelphia, New York, Boston. All right, uh, Cincinnati is getting up there. They were our first meatpacking city. They were called Porkopolis. And the, the one southern huge city, New Orleans, at the base of the Mississippi. Looking at the notes. Cities were part of the West from its beginning. Cities that stood at the intersection of interregional inter trade, such as Cincinnati, a center of pig slaughterhouses, Porkopolis, and St. Louis, grew enormously and quickly. Chicago was the West's greatest city, the second city. Thanks to the railroad and its location on the Great Lakes, Chicago by 1860 was the fourth largest city in the nation, serving as a center where Western farm products were collected and shipped east, which I talked about earlier. Urban centers in the West and East experienced great changes wrought or brought on by the market revolution. The number of people in cities increased dramatically. Urban merchants, bankers, and master craftsmen exploited the expanding market among commercial farmers. Remember, we were still dominated by artisans. It was not until after the Civil War that it began to speed up. Artisans being pushed into the factories was very slow. It happened at different times, at different paces, at different pla in different places, in different industries. So it was very, very loose. The, their efforts to increase production and reduce labor costs transformed work. Some artisans are the ones who became the owners of Macy's uh, and Lord and & Taylor and major factories. The artisans that did not expand their storefronts are the ones who became the workers in the factories. Skilled artisans who once made an entire product at home in their storefront, where they controlled their own work, were now gathered in large workshops, these early factories, where entrepreneurs supervised them. You had bosses. You were not the boss of your own labor anymore as labor was being divided, as machines were being installed. Their tasks were subdivided, division of labor, and they were paid a wage. Wage work was becoming a lot more common during this market revolution. Uh, a wage to perform only one process in production, division of labor. These workers faced relentless pressure from employers to make more goods faster and at lower wages. That will be something that we will talk in much more depth about later in the unit. And as you can see, cities were moving west and they got even bigger. The cities that were already there in the east got bigger and popping up is Detroit, Milwaukee, Chicago got bigger, St. Louis got bigger, New Orleans got bigger, Louisville, Cleveland, All right? Buffalo became bigger, big enough to have a World's Fair in 1890s. All right, or was it, was it 1902 or four? I forget what exact year. All right, so moving on. Actually, not moving on yet. Let's go back to that slide. We've got to look at the notes underneath. So transportation, I'm looking at the notes underneath the slide. Transportation and communication improvements fostered the growth of the West as a new region. Between 1790 and 1840, around 4.5 million people crossed the Appalachian Mountains, which would be uh, right around here. Okay, Much of it after the War of 1812, when land-hungry Easterners, white Easterners, moved west uh, and squatted on land. Between 1815 and 1821, Indiana, Illinois, Missouri, Alabama, Mississippi, and Maine became states. Three different streams of settlers moved west, small farmers and, and planters, plantation owners, with slaves in the south, who created the Cotton Kingdom of Alabama, Mississippi, Louisiana, and Arkansas, the Deep South. Farm families from the Upper South who moved to Southern Ohio, Indiana, and Illinois, and New Englanders who moved across New York to Northern Ohio, Indiana, Illinois, Michigan, and Wisconsin. The market revolution and westward expansion, which occurred at the same time in the North and the South, increased divisions between these sections. Perhaps the most dynamic characteristic of America, America's economy in the early 1800s was the birth of the Cotton Kingdom. The early Industrial Revolution in England was based in cotton textile factories, which demanded a huge amount of cotton. The Deep South was suited to growing cotton, and once Eli Whitney invented the cotton gin, which quickly would separate cotton from seeds, cotton production quickened, became very profitable, and spread. Whitney's invention, along with new western lands, Louisiana Purchase, and factory demand for cotton, revolutionized American slavery. The amount of slaves in this country quadrupled from 1 million 
in 1800 to, six, uh, to 4 million by 1860. Once expected to die out with tobacco, slavery was expanded by cotton. So when Congress outlawed the Atlantic slave trade in 1808, a massive internal slave trade uh, grew in the U.S., in which st uh, slaves in the older slave states of Maryland, Virginia, and South Carolina were sold to the newer slave areas of the Deep South. There's kind of like a trail of tears of the slaves walking from one region to the other. Between 1800 and 1860, about one million slaves were sold and forcibly moved west in the uh, internal slave trade. Though Jefferson imagined the West would secure the future of an American republic populated by independent small farmers, he thought Louisiana Purchase would be uh, an empire of liberty. It becomes an empire of slavery. Uh, slave plantations producing cotton for export becomes the basis of this empire of liberty. Moving on. All right. So looking at the notes underneath here. Economic growth fueled a demand for labor, which was partly filled by immigrants, the Irish. Immigration swelled between 1840 and 1860, when over 4 million people came to the United States, mostly from Ireland and Germany, Irish to the cities, Germans to rural areas, hence the Pennsylvania Dutch. They're Germans. Modernization of agriculture, the Industrial Revolution, and steamship and rail transportation spurred many of these migrants to America. Most went to the north, where jobs were plenty and slaves were few, and would not, uh, and would not compete with them. Very few immigrants went to the southern states, so they remained homogenous, uh, white and black, uh, white Anglo-Saxon, Protestant and black. Uh, except for peripheral cities such as New Orleans, St. Louis, or Baltimore. Immigrants in northern cities and rural areas were quite visible. Many Germans established themselves in the West, including Cincinnati, St. Louis, and Milwaukee, or the, quote, German Triangle, it was called. Remember that. While English immigrants were easily absorbed in American culture, the Irish faced bitter hostility. They were Roman Catholics in a mostly Protestant society with deeply anti-Catholic traditions, and they increased the visibility and power of the Catholic Church. Irish immigrants in the 1840s and 50s alarmed many, quote, native-born Americans, white Anglo-Saxon Protestants, and nativists who feared the impact of immigration on American political and social life. Blamed immigrants, they blamed immigrants for crime, for political corruption, for heavy drinking, uh, and the job competition that they brought with them that seemed to undercut wages for the native-born white Anglo-Saxon skilled workers. As immigrants got paid less, they would carry down the wages of everybody. Remember, the Irish, uh, they were Papists. They followed the Pope. They were Catholic, so they couldn't be truly independent in the eyes of the uh, white Anglo-Saxon Protestant. The Irish were also rapidly integrating into the Democratic Party's urban political landscape. They were becoming Democrats, which dispense, the Democratic Party would dispense jobs, give out jobs, and uh, give out poor relief to immigrants in return for votes. Nativists believed the Irish in particular were a lazy, childlike, and irrational, unintelligent people, unfamiliar with American ideas of liberty, and they felt they were subservient to the Catholic Church, thus threatening democratic institutions, social reform, and public education. Riots by white Anglo-Saxon Protestants targeted immigrants and their institutions, and nativist politicians were elected in the 1840s and 50s. Now, to end up, this chart is meant to show you that uh, from 1820 to 1860, uh, manufacturing was on the increase, and agriculture was on the decrease. So by 1880, we will have the first time where uh, manufacturing, or I'm sorry, agriculture, will not be the greatest number on a chart such as this. Manufacturing began to outnumber agriculture in the 1880 census for the first time in American history. So be sure to take the quiz that will pop up right now.